It's always so cool to be here with all these really young people and really old books. <laughs> I love it. So I'm gonna, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about my new book, and Paula is going to talk about her new book. And we both realize that she doesn't know anything about my book, and I don't know anything about her stupid book. So we're going to have to like, learn something about each other in the next 15 minutes. And then we'll, t we'll talk a little bit, and if you have questions, we'll answer them, and we hope you enjoy our books. And is it possible to make it a little bit darker in here? Is that, does that happen, or no? Dangerous? It's okay. Um, so my book is called Design is Storytelling, and it's a, a book, oh wow, I love it, and the Christmas lights. <laughs> Get, someone's gonna bring in a big turkey soon. <laughs> This is so great. Um, we could sing gospel music because everybody's so hushed, right? So let's just relax. Um, so, so I wrote this book called Design and Storytelling, and it's published by Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum. I'm really thankful to all my colleagues for supporting the book. And it's really a book about four designers and anybody interested in design to apply techniques of narrative to the design process. Um, and I thought I'd just talk a little bit about what the book is like, uh, since we don't have a, a lot of time and you can go home and, and read it. So because the book is about storytelling, I wanted it to be a picture book. So it's full of illustrations. And, and early on in my process, I decided no photographs. I didn't want it to look like a design book full of pictures of real objects or real stores or examples of you know, printed things. I, I really wanted it to be very pictorial. And so it, it's full of pictures. Uh, some of them are by famous illustrators like Adrian Tomein, this incredible love story. Um, on the IRT that made me think of myself and Abbott Miller in 1985, um, and Christoph Niemann, the incredible designer and illustrator. Um, I use him to talk about how our eyes uh, make a story, make a path when we look at illustrations and, and take them apart. This is an illustration by Emily Jointon, who's a MICA illustration MFA, amazing, talented person. A few of them are my pictures. This is my painting of Romeo and Juliet impersonated by two bottles of shampoo. Why not? Uh, but most of the pictures are, are by my friend Jenny Tobias, who's here tonight. Um, and really making this book was so much fun. I cried when we were done because we spent two years together making these pictures and having these long weekends where I would be writing and she would be drawing whatever it was. Um, these are, are cats at a focus group, <laughs> essential topic. Um, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs interpreted as a chocolate sundae with a cherry on top. Um, that's Kevin helping Jenny do some of the pictures in the book. Um, the book is a drama in three acts. Uh, and I, I enjoyed structuring it that way. I wanted this kind of feeling of narrativity to kind of run through the whole book. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about action, which is act one. Um, so if we think about um, what is the definition of a story, really key to it is the idea of action. Um, and Aristotle kind of got it right way back when, when he said that a story is a whole action of a certain magnitude. And in his poetics, his example of what a sort of the, the archetypal uber story is, is the story of Oedipus. Um, so Jenny and I thought, like, well, how could we make Oedipus interact with graphic design today? Um, so that's Oedipus's car. You'll see it says Rex, uh, vanity plate on the back. And we imagine Oedipus as this young, uh, angry young man leaving home to make his fortune. Um, and, and Jenny painted, painted this picture. I painted the surrounding scene. And we did this in May 2016. It was about the month after Prince died. Um, so of course, Oedipus is driving a little red Corvette. And Oedipus gets to the toll booth, and there's a really long line for cash 
and there's an even longer line for easy pass, but there's a third lane that nobody's in, an empty lane, and Oedipus looks at all these gray cars, and he's like, I'm gonna get in the empty lane, and the empty lane is riddles. And so Oedipus gets in the riddles lane, and the rest is tragic history. He meets the Sphinx, he marries his mom, very bad things happen to Oedipus for choosing the fast lane in his fast car. Um, so that's kind of the archetypal story, and to me, thinking about graphic design and driving and signage, you know, that largely what we do as graphic designers is tell people where to go, what to look at, what to buy, which button to push. Um, and I started as I worked on this book and thinking about the idea of time and action and narrative and really thinking that what we do is create paths for people. Um, if you think about what's happened to New York City on our streets and how they've been transformed over the, over the last five years, really just by painting new stuff on the ground. It's probably Paula's fault, right? All these places where now there's bikes or there's, you can put a cafe chair there or you know, whatever. And it's really just graphic design on the street creating different uh, paths for people. There's a beautiful quote from, uh, from Tim Ingold about places, that places are created by the path of people wandering through them. And if you think about what we create as graphic designers or interior designers or service designers or user experience designers, we are creating a place or an opportunity for people to make a path. Um, and really the work only comes alive when that path is taken. Um, so my book is full of different models, different kind of tools that designers can use uh, to predict the path and shape the path of people. Um, one of them is the hero's journey. Um, and if you think about a hero, perhaps what comes to mind is another friend of Aristotle, um, Odysseus. Or maybe you have a more 20th century kind of mind and you think of Superman. Um, I'm a woman, so I think of Dorothy. And so Dorothy has this path, and it's an archetype that's repeated over and over again from the Odyssey to um, Mad Max Fury Road. And it's an archetype of being in an ordinary world and having a call to adventure and entering a new world, a magic place, it's also often a green place, think of the city of Oz, the archetypal green place, and ultimately the hero leaves and goes home. I could never understand why Dorothy went back to Kansas, but she did, because that's the law of the hero's adventure. That's what she has to do, right? Uh, Jenny and I translated this to the, the hero's journey of this book. Um, so the, there's a call number to adventure, and the book is, has trials and ordeals and terrible things befall her. Uh, she ends up in the abyss, the belly of the whale, which is a big tote bag, and inside the tote bag are things like Warby Parker sunglasses and a stray tampon, uh, a dead fish. Somehow those things all go together. And the reward for her suffering is becoming a beach book. It would be my greatest happiness if somebody here reads my book on a beach, somewhere, anywhere, please send me a picture. Um, and ultimately the return, the eternal return uh, to the beginning. So that's the hero's journey. Um, and we can see this kind of cycle and the idea of the hero in all kinds of design experiences. If you've ever been to Ikea, you might think, um, that you were in a maze. Well, I researched this, and I found that actually Ikea is not a maze. It's a labyrinth, and that's a different kind of path. A maze is a puzzle designed to fool you, to trick you, to confuse you. It's where you go to die at the end of The Shining. <laughs> a labyrinth is a meditative 
path where you don't actually have to make any decisions. Um, and these were actually put into medieval churches so that people could follow the path and have this meditative walk. Um, and so in Ikea stores, there is actually only one way you're supposed to go. So in a maze, you wander around like at Walmart, but at Ikea, there's this, there's this parade. It's like the temptation of Christ. It's this set of experiences <coughs> that includes um, tiny pencils, stuff like that, um, and a descent, right, and ultimately leaving with the final hot dog, two for 99 cents, which they are literally giving that away so that you have a positive experience and don't die in the parking lot. Um, so thinking about these paths and the, the journey of the user and also the degree to which we as designers create opportunities of, for freedom versus control, right? And I think it, it, it points to an ethical dilemma in everything we do. To what degree are we offering infinite choice and possibly confusion? And to what degree are we creating this procession this fixed path. Um, and I'll, I'll end by just talking about uh, w one of the things that authors do that you probably don't know how it works, which is we get our books blurbed. And this means that we write emails uh, to people who we think might put up with us, and we ask them to blurb the book based on a PDF. And most of the people read the introduction and basically quote from the introduction. Um, and one of the people that I asked to blurb my book uh, is, is Ruben Pater, who's an incredible young critical designer and design historian from the Netherlands. He wrote an, a great book that you must read called The Politics of Design. He asked me to blurb his book and I forgot. <laughs> Biggest mistake I ever made. I wish I had my blurb on the back of his goddamn book, his adorable book. But anyway, he wrote a blurb for my book where he said my book was feminist. And I was so amazed. It was so not regurgitating anything from my introduction. And I was so delighted that he saw that the book had this female point of view. Um, and that's really there. There's Medusa, another goddess. Uh, this is from a chapter about the gaze and about the active, dynamic character of looking and really putting a kind of sexual politics into the gaze as something aggressive and powerful, whether you're Medusa um, or Albrecht Durer inventing the grid um, or the Gorilla Girls creating a different way to look at women's bodies. Um, so thinking about the gaze as something active. And all through the book, there are chicks. There are women uh, theorists, designers, artists, illustrators. I mean, there's some dudes, too. I really worked hard to find really talented men to contribute. Because you know how awful it is, Paula, when you go to a conference and it's like all women. And you're like, why couldn't they find any guys to speak? <laughs> it's like if you really call enough of them, someone will say yes. Um, so there are guys in the book, but it's a lot of women, a lot of work by um, female students I know, by just great writers about design and theory. This is Cinderella um, trying to get to the prince's castle. Um, this is Sonia Delaunay and Frida Kahlo in the chapter about storyboarding. Um, and then there's just something chick-like about turning Don Norman's three stages of design emotions into a popsicle. It's like, that's what we do, right? Um, so that's the, that's the book. Um, and I, I got Little Red Riding Hood to write me the final blurb, because really this is a book for her. It's for the little girl lost in the woods, trying to find a path, and we make signage for her, okay? And that's it for my spiel, and Paula's gonna come up and tell us about her book. Thank you. There I am. So um, I 
did not write a book. I'm a subject of a book, which is a, sort of a weird thing because theoretically I should be more famous than I am or dead to be actually a subject of a book. But um, there are two terrific London graphic designers. One is the author and designer Adrian Shaughnessy, and the other is a gentleman named Tony Brook, who is a principal of a company called Spin. And they embarked on a publishing project that uh, enabled them to produce books that they sell exclusively online, that are produced the way they want to produce them, on subjects and designers that they are interested in. It's completely eclectic, but quite spectacular, and I really do admire their books. I wrote a book on my own work in 2002, it came out. It was called Make It Bigger. And in that book, I wrote about working with clients, and it was, uh, it was autobiographical, but a true narrative about the kind of relationship we all have with our clients. And to be honest with you, I never thought I could write a better book than that. Um, even though 15 years went by and I made a lot of new work and had a lot of equally lousy experiences, I couldn't really have the, the energy to do it. And one day uh, in New York, uh, I was having lunch with Tony and Adrian at the Union Square Cafe. And they asked me rather sheepishly if I would be interested in letting them produce a book on my work and about the work I've done through the record industry in the early 70s to my own business to my 27 years at Pentagram. And, and uh, I was absolutely floored by it. This is supposed to move. Does this? The reason I don't know how to work this, by the way, is because I didn't put together the slideshow Adrian Shaughnessy did. It's actually the book slideshow. <laughs> so I don't actually know how it operates. Does it have to be clicked? It should be on a, on a loop. There we go. OK, it's looping. So they, the book is in chronological order. And Tony Brooke took my work, and he edited it, and he put together this document that's about 560 pages. The beginning is a, a very long interview um, with Adrian, which I, I feel is very personal and uh, about as honest as I could be in an interview. And I read it and thought, oh, I should really cross things out because they were, they were sort of exposed more than I thought necessary. But in fact, I like, I like it as a document. The um, record industry work is shown at a large scale where you don't really see this anymore and it hasn't been published in, in quite some time. So it, it sort of charms me to see a lot of these things pulled out again. And it is organized, uh, as I said, chronologically, but also against subject matter. So there are sections that are purely about personal work, things I wrote, things um, I responded to, op-ed pieces I did in the New York Times, posters I made for free projects that I was just interested in. There's a, a large section on uh, corporate identities, and it starts really with uh, the identity I did for Manhattan Records in 1984 all the way through to things I, I did last year. And the same thing for environmental graphics. So the work is uh, this, this, this funny kind of um, zigzag of chronology and type, and somehow it lines up. There is a total section in the, in the last section of the book is, represents my 24 years of being the designer for the public theater and um, sort of the broadest collection of the theater posters and the work that I've done in for the public in one place, and, and it's a fairly strong section. The experience of doing it was bizarre, because if you give your life to somebody, and they take it and they edit it, you look at it coming back, and sometimes you think, well, it didn't quite happen that way. Mostly it was a question of order. Like, you looked at, you looked at the work, and you thought, well, that's funny. That doesn't make any sense. Like, I couldn't have done that then. It had to be some other time. And you find yourself reordering it. And then you realize you're actually making it worse. So there was this notion of looking at it and trying to pull myself back from it while it was actually happening. It's as if somebody went into your clothes closet 
and told you what you were going to wear and hung them up in the order in which you, wore, you have to wear them. And you'd suddenly feel, oh my god. But I did, in fact, get used to it. As a matter of fact, I rather liked it because I think in the end, I never could have done as beautiful a job as these guys did because they were dispassionate and critical. And that, that I think, is what made the book insightful and, and very strong. On the other hand, what I find really strange about the book is, I have to say, it's been out since last May, and people have ordered it. It came in hardcover, which is sold out. There are some of the paperbacks left, and they'll go into a reprint when they sell them out, because they, they, don't, they don't pay for space for books lying around. That's a very big part of their business. So I have two copies of my, that I bought left, and they're, they're sitting on a bookshelf um, next to me at Pentagram, and I almost never open them. I, I don't look at it. It's, it's like a strange thing, because I did all of this work, and much of it you're seeing on the screen, and um, I know I did it, and I know how I felt when I did it, and the stories of how I did it are in the book, but what's weird is I've already done it and you have to sort of close that up and go on with the rest of your life or you find you're living in your own closet. So that's what I have to say about the book. And I'd like to talk to Ellen about hers. So thank you. So we're, we're supposed to sit on these like director chairs but I not like molest them. anybody. <laughs> I'll try. It's hard for me. <laughs> it's hard to molest from a director's chair. But it can be done, I've heard, right? <laughs> well, yeah, somebody has to sit on you is the way that yeah, works. Yeah, right. For money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And fame. Right, any, any kind of manipulation will right. do. So, so you have this book on your shelf that you don't open. Is it sort of like Pandora's box or Dorian Gray, like a kind of fear of uh, I think it's seeing weird, what's in there? Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, a, it's a strange, it's a really strange thing. I like giving it to people. I just don't want to open it when they, you know, they can, they can look at it. It, it is, I, I, we, I use the book sometimes for reference material. Like if there's a client and I have to show them something. You need really ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Like, no one will know I did this before because... <laughs> I don't need the book for that. I can do that all by myself. <laughs> no, the thing, is, the thing is weird is that I, I, um, I use it as, like, if somebody has to see something, if, they want to, if, if a client wants to see a project I work on, I might pull it out because it's an easier way to show them than to, to dig it out on the Pentagram website. But, well, that's uh, for sure. But <laughs> now the new website, new websites fleet. <laughs> but the but the um, the reality is that looking at it is there's something very icky about it. Not the book. The book is the book I love. Is something there's something icky about this thing that was made that's about me. That is is a weird. Now some of you may have seen the movie. The Paula Cher movie. See, we don't have very many people in our field who have their own movie. Right, there's that font Coming movie, soon. Helvetica. <laughs> right, nobody even likes Helvetica, but we all went to see the movie because it was like church. It was like, yeah. you go with your people and you see the story of your making. You're like, I think that's true. And it, but Paula has a movie that's like, everybody loves it because it's such beautiful work and it's such... Um, that was amazing yeah. film. It's amazing. So, does it is it icky for you to watch the movie? Uh, like, if I had a book and a movie, I think I would kind of like them both. <laughs> you have many books, and yeah, but I had to write my book. See, she roles. didn't even have to write her book. <laughs> I'm lazy. I have to write all these goddamn books. <laughs> No, I think I, the movie is interesting. I actually, I actually feel less icky about the movie than I do about the book, because because I I know I know how the movie worked. You know, like for example, the director Richard Press photographed me for four days, and he interviewed me. He interviewed me for about a day and a half, which was not terribly different uh, different from many interviews I've given. But the way he cut the movie, he did everything in post production. And he, he sliced and diced in the most beautiful, perfect way. 
that he put this, this really, this statement about graphic design together. And the guy was a graphic designer. I mean, he actually understood the profession. He understood what I was talking about. He knew who the players were. He knew, he knew everything about it before he was doing it. So he's one of five people on the planet right. that Absolutely. understands what graphic design is. But now more people do. No, he, he, did a great, he did a great job. And like to me, when I look at that movie, I, you know, I, can, I, I know that he caught parts of me, but that was really, I can really see I can see his his craft and and what a good filmmaker he is. With the, with the with the book, what's different about the book is the the collection of it. You know that it's not it's not there's a, there's an interview in the part in the front that I have an easier time reading than I do looking at at the 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 book of work, where in in abstract they actually don't really shove that much work. You know, I mean, there's a couple of key pieces that people can recognize. Three hundred pieces. <laughs> <laughs> there really yeah, yeah, no, I, mean, it's I, true. I looked at it critically. There isn't that yeah. much. It, it looks like there's a lot there. It, focused it, some on some of it like moves around fast. They spin it. It looks like uh -huh. all kinds of shit's happening with it that really never happened. So, sort of like, so Paula's book is this kind of rare tome, and there's only a few of them even here tonight because it's such a rare and it's collectible it's too thing. Expensive Mine is for like returns, a magazine. There's like a ton of them. The first thing I did when I walked in here tonight, I was all like nervous walking around. As I went over to the shelf to see if I could find a first edition of Stephen King's It, and I thought, I'm going to be the one that finds it, and I will be rich, and I will, it's not there, so spare, spare yourself the agony. It would have been right on that shelf. I've never found anything on these shelves that I, <laughs> that I expected to be there, but they're sort of amazing. I also like the smell in here. Isn't it great? I'm wearing that, actually. It's, um, <laughs> It's true, I have this perfume on called In the Library by Christopher Brogius. <laughs> Come smell me. Just, I consent to that. <laughs> yeah. So any questions from the audience before we kind of... Sign books? Yeah. I have six books. That's oh my it. God. <laughs> she has six books. I have like 300 back there. So I'll be so embarrassed with my too many books. But we, um, would, we would like questions. So, so yeah. please ask. If you want to raise your hand, I'll bring you a mic. I'll try to do a lap right here. Yeah, good, good. Hi, uh, my name is Vakas, and my question is, uh, is it's a bit serious. So <gasps> we're in a <laughs> political moment, which is so much about communication and distilling an idea down to its essence. And uh, you know, both of you are masters at that. And uh, so is, some might argue, you know, the president. He's really good at branding. So from your many years of experience, how, what insights or what thoughts do you have when you think about ideas being communicated today? And how can, I mean, I'm sure there's no like simple solution. I, have, I actually do have a simple solution. Yeah. I, I heard this story on NPR last week about an insurance company in Miami that is um, getting people who are not typically in the market and a lot of Hispanic people in the Miami area, they've had this whole campaign, all in Spanish, amazing, um, this kind of voiceover, and all the images are puppies. <laughs> and everybody shares these puppy videos that are about insurance, health insurance. And I feel like we could sell anything, sell even the puppies. Democratic Party could be saved by puppies. <laughs> I think that's it. I actually think that, that uh, what's really scary is how stuff becomes codified really fast. That it's not, it's not, ju it's not just branding where you're so, sort of trying to create this image. It's about this form of division, that you're in one group if you think this way, and you're in another group if you think that way, and that the parsing of, of sort of divisive um, uh, content to talk to specific groups, I've never seen anything like it. I, to be honest right, with even you, the groups are divided now. Well, the, right? even within even within yeah. subsets of groups. I mean, that's sort of what's going on with the the, uh, the Roy Moore thing to a degree, where where these things are broken up. And the question is, I, I don't know where that thinking came from because I I don't remember that as a sell tactic. You know that you didn't you you tried to broaden, not 
divide. That was the whole goal of, you know, you wanted to get the biggest audience you can. And that, that codification, you could talk to a, a certain group of, you know, like you wanted people to go to a specific club, but you didn't, you didn't do it in this completely divisive way. So there's a whole new brand of advertising. I don't know how to work. It's very, it's very strange. And I think it has to do, it, it has to do with, uh, stuff I think I knew how to do in high school but forgot about how to do as an adult because there's something, there seems to be something You mean really, like mean girl yeah, stuff? Yes, very mean girl. It's a, she it was is, a bully uh, in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I wasn't. I was very No, nice. you were so cute. And the, and the movie it shows how cute she was. I mean, she's always been cute, but high school? No, it's, no, I, no I, think that, I think this is very interesting in terms of, of how you combat that because it's, it's, it's bullying. And, and, and it, it, it pushes people in different directions, and it happens every single day now. I mean, like I, I, I can't even, you know, my phone rings with it all the time. It's like beeping with horrible, nasty stuff that I don't understand. And you get, all you do is get angry and think, oh, it's the other group, and the other group hates you, and you're done. So do you have a solution to that? <laughs> There's some questions on that side I saw earlier. I'm bringing the mic in. Just because we're in the Strand, I love books. I was wondering what are some of your favorite book covers all time. Mine's um, Portnoy's Complaint by uh, Philip Roth. The yellow with the red text, or black text. I don't know if you know that. That was, the, that was uh, uh, Paul Bacon. Uh, Bacon. Or, yeah. yeah, it was Paul Bacon. And uh, also some of the books that you're currently reading and some of your favorites as well. Uh, favorite book jackets. I, I can tell you who my... Uh, favorite book jacket art director was, and you can all look him up, is a guy in the 70s named Harris Lewine, oh, who, yeah. who did an incredible, he, he worked with all, all the terrific designers of the time, and Paul Bacon was one of them, Pushpin did a lot of books for them, but the books are amazing. Um, uh, he did the Harlem on My Mind book uh, that I remember seeing, which, which I was just gobstruck from at the time it came out. It was really amazing. I still look at that. Another, another great favorite book in all ways was designed by my former partner, David Hillman, and it's called A Thousand Makers of the 20th Century. And it's got the best layout of pictures and text of massive stuff in a book ever as a compendium. You've got to really check it out. They're great. Paula's book is my favorite. <laughs> What else? Anybody got, yeah, we got one here. I'm really tired of those websites that you just keep scrolling down. And even if you try to click on something, it just opens up another part of that same page. I like the old time when you'd be a menu and you click on things and go different places. I feel trapped. <laughs> like I'm in a Warby Parker store. Like everything <laughs> is controlled, you know? I like feeling like I can have some place to go. I, I'm very annoyed with f new features on everything. I don't, I don't want any more features. I think there are <laughs> enough features. I, I, I don't, you know that the um, Sony grabbed my television set and took control this weekend. It completely said that you, I had to download some software that I absolutely don't need. Never do that. I just think that's, uh, why or why, where did this start? I mean, I don't want people coming. What if somebody goes in and says, you have to throw out your underwear and get all new underwear. I mean, that's sort of like what that's, that's like. It's very, and I, don't, I wouldn't call it a design trend, but it's an expectation that actually that's acceptable behavior. I don't know where that started. But Adobe it's Creative I mean, Suite. I don't know started. why I need to. <laughs> right, like the toolbox. That's horrible. Okay, one more question. Colin. Hello. Um, Paul, I... Uh, like many people, I'm a big fan of your work for the public theater. And um, over so many years of doing it, I was just wondering um, how you keep coming to it like a fresh, coming back to the sort of the same idea, but in a fresh new way. I'm sure there is some uh, one, one season or two that comes around and you're like, oh, how am I going to come up with another design for the public? But 
um, it, and you keep bringing out like such new and exciting work for them year. Well, not year, if I so. look at the book. <laughs> <laughs> you so. can't. You can't. You can't go back. the The public theater has been like a, an amazing thing that I. I if everybody has a relationship with something, somebody that works that where you like the relationship and you, and you have a, a good dialogue, hold on to it, because there. I th I think the best work is where you actually stay with something, have mistakes, and get to grow, and that's, that's what makes you be able to reinvent. And I think I'm, I'm better at it for doing it 24 years than doing it for 12, you know, that, that <laughs> or, for, or for four, because, because you have to grow. Th so it, the uh, summer's coming. Um, they've got the plays. I've got to go down and, and, and have the conversation about what the spirit of the thing is, which I have with Oscar Eustace each year, and then figure out what the deal is. And that the exciting part of that is that whatever it is has to be like its own mini identity for a year because they, what we do is we sort of, we sort of take the, the poster and it's its own branding manual, you know, that you take it apart and you reuse the elements to make everything else which is what the team there does. And it's, it's, it is, we've been doing this, I think, for five or six years, and that's, that's what I think helped keeping it fresh every year because it can't look like the past year, so that you're already forced to change it, but it still has to look like the public. So it's an interesting puzzle. I really love doing it. I, I, I think I'm lucky to have it. And um, if you have an opportunity, and you, you probably have one if you haven't been thinking about it, take it because, because they're amazing relationships. It isn't about money, it's about doing it. Cool, that's so, that's so great. It probably helps that the content's so great too, right? Well, it's nice, it, you know, <laughs> I mean, Shakespeare's a good writer, and... <laughs> not okay, as good thank, as Ellen. Thank you, thank yeah, you. Thank you both so much, and thank, thank all of you for coming. You.